Hi, I'm Eagle, I'm a data scientist living in London, and welcome to another episode of this time series crash course. In this video, we're going to discuss the Serima model, which is the seasonal version of the regular Arima model we discussed in the previous video. The things we will cover are, what is Serima, what are the requirements for Serima, how we fit Serima model, and how we can do it all in Python. So let's get into it. On the screen now is a notebook that we're going to work through that's going to tell us all about Serima and how we can apply it in Python. So, like I said, in my previous post, we discussed arguably the most famous and useful, or one of the most useful forecasting methods of um, ARIMA. So ARIMA stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. So basically it's a combination of all those three things. So autoregressive is where we use the previous lags to forecast in the future. Integrated refers to differencing, so how many times we difference the data. And moving average is where we fit the model using the fitted errors historically. I've covered all these three topics individually in the past, um, so make sure you check out those videos um, as I won't spend too much time on it here. One of the main disadvantages of ARIMA is that it lacks awareness of any seasonality components. A lot of time series in general have some sort of seasonal fluctuations, you know, yearly, quarterly, uh, weekly, etc. And the ARIMA model doesn't capture these unless you include loads of lags. But it's not really feasible when you have, for example, daily data at a yearly seasonality, right? You're not going to include 365 regressors. That's overkill, and it's not very, you know, just in general, it's not um, compute efficient. So this is where we have Serima, so we can add the seasonal components in. Now, the way Serima works is basically kind of an extension of Arima. Um, and so Arima looks like this. So like I said, it has three components. The also regressive, integrated, and moving average. Um, here is the autoregressive part, the thigh, uh, thigh end of the coefficients we're trying to find, and yt minus n is the lag at a certain value of n. And p is the number of, of the orders we use, so the number of lags we include in the model. Theta here is the coefficients for the moving average, so the error terms, which are here given by epsilon, and these are the errors of the fitted model um, in various time lags up to q, and q is the number of lags for the moving average components. And a dash here refers to the fact that the data is differenced. Um, I specified all these th things individually here, if you want to read through that along with this notebook, it's also going to be linked in the description below, so if you want to check it out um, and go through it by yourself, feel free. Also, the blog that belongs to this notebook is also going to be linked in the description, um, so if you want this in a readable format, feel free to check it out as well. So, the way we write ARIMA is like this, so ARIMA PDQ, where P is the number of autoregressive components, D is the like differencing or the integration values, like how many times we difference it, and Q is the moving average. Again, just discuss this above, but this is the notation you generally find with ARIMA models. Now, what ARIMA does is that it kind of adds an extra layer to this. So here on the left are this C, this summation here, and the summation here is a classic ARIMA. Now, what ARIMA does is that it adds these big P and big Q. So you see here, P, Q. And what these are, these are the the values at the various um the, at the previous season so n is the obviously the time step but m is the number of seasonal va values so well seasonal value length of season right so say we have data that is a monthly index it will typically have a yearly seasonality of 12. so in this case m will equal 12. so what the serum does is that it adds the value say a t it looks at the value of the previous um, season 40. So in this case, it'd be minus 12, right? So if we have June data, it may look at, you know, the past months, which would be, you know, uh, May and April, but then it also look at last season's June value and the fitted error to last season's June value. So that's what Serena was doing. It's adding this knowledge of looking at the lag and the error terms at the previous season. Um, and that's just the general gist of it, right? And so you write Serena like this, so we have the PDQ, which are the classic ARIMA components, and we also have big P, big Q, D, and big Q. Um, and this is M specifies the season. And these PDQ are all in terms of seasonal, so the previous seasonal value. And so this is a nice way of writing it. So it's really not that complicated, really, if you think about it. It's just saying, you know, as well as looking at the previous lags, let's also look at the previous season and see what happened there. Um, and then encode that information then, because we can say like, oh, well, you know, so so far this year, you know, the the stock has been increasing, but we know every time around October it's going to drop. And so that information will be coded in there. So even if it's increasing over the past few months, we know in October time it's always going to drop. 
Um, so that's a basic example. So that's how you kind of code seasonality. So the way you, you know, the requirements behind fitting a streamer model is very similar to the Rima model. Is that you need data to be stationary, and what this means that your data is has consistent statistical, statistical properties through time. Um, what that really means is, in general sense, for most cases, is that your mean is constant, so you've got no trend, and that your variance is also constant, so you've got no fluctuations that are increasing in nature throughout time. The way you produce a stationary time series is something I've discussed in loads of previous videos before, uh, but the main ones are differencing to stabilize the mean, and also the logarithm transform to stabilize the variance. You can also use a box Cox transform, which is a more advanced version of the logarithm transform, and also a better way of doing it as a more robust. Again, I'm not going to go through in too much detail. We'll carry out this process in this video, but if you want to learn those concepts in more detail, make sure you check out the other videos in this playlist where I cover those. The next thing is selecting the number of orders. So kind of like with a Rima, we know we need to find P, D, Q, but we also need to find the big P, big D, and big Q. Um, the way you do this is through regular differencing. So the way you find D is normal differencing, and big D is seasonal differencing. Again, I've covered seasonal differencing in the previous video before. It's not very very complicated. All you do is that you take the, the values and you take, and you take away the value of that previous season. Um, and that's the seasonal difference. Again, you can deduce whether the series is stationary um, by using the augmented Dickey filter test. I've done this in a previous video, um, but it's a constant way of measuring if your data is indeed stationary. The autoregressive components uh, can be done through uh, the partial creation function and the and the and the error terms, the moving average values, can be done through the autocorrelation function. Again, I've done this in a previous video, I'm not going to spend too much time on it here, um, we're just building upon these previous concepts to you know, unify them all together in the end to show how you actually use all these ideas to model. Uh, but if you want to know more about the PACF and the ACF, make sure you check out the other videos in this playlist. But what it does is that it plots a something called a coagulam, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, which is basically a correlation plot of the lags um, to the current value, right? So if it has, if it, if it's, if you see, we will see basically that if the value of a lag at a certain um, interval is really high, then that means there's some seasonal component based in there, and so we can identify the number of seasonal parameters that way. Again, we'll go for an example later on to make this a bit more concrete, uh, but that's a general gist of it. And as I said here, these coagulams basically allow us to observe the seasonal pattern, if any. Um, as for example, the Serima 000, so it means the Arima model has no lags, no differencing, and no moving average for the Arima components, but it has one seasonal lag, and the data is indexed by four, right? So it will show an exponential decay in the lags for ACF, but a significant spike at lag four, right? So what he's saying is that every four flag, we're gonna see a really big correlation of the current time step. And because we're gonna see a really big correlation, um, and the data is indexed by month, what this will mean is that we have an example of quarterly seasonality, right? Um, because you know the months repeat every three and or every four, sorry, so we have quarter seasonality. Um, so this is a basic example. Again, we'll go through it in more detail later on. And the final thing is how do we estimate these parameters? Well, we use the classical well, you pretty much use everywhere machine learning, that is maximum lighting estimation. Um, so that estimates basically what is the most probable values given this distribution for the coefficients. Um, you know, which coefficient is most likely to generate that data. This is used throughout pretty much all of statistics data science, so I definitely recommend you look up it up if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but that's basically how we do it. The main thing is that MLE assumes an online distribution. Um, so it typically assumes a normal distribution, hence why we need to have a stationary uh, time series because that means all the data and every data point in that time series belongs to the same um, statistical distribution. Right. Enough of that, let's put this all into practice, like I said, because that's the best way of doing it. We'll first begin with plotting our basic data set. This is the airline passenger volume, again, linked in the description below inside the notebook and also the um, blog. But essentially, it's just, don't worry too much about it, it's just US airline passenger volume between in the 50s. And what it is, is that it's showing that it's increasing through time, and we have some obvious seasonality every year, right? It's indexed by month, so we have in the summer months, we have more airline passengers, and in the winter months, we have less airline passengers. Now, like I said, it's an obvious trend and obvious seasonality. Therefore, the data is not stationary because it, the mean is increasing and the variance is increasing through time. So we need to apply differencing in the box Cox transform. 
So by do, by the way we do that is by we call the box cox function from scipy stats, dead simple. And then all we do is just dot diff method and pandas. Again, very simple. And we plot the result in series. Now this looks pretty much stationary. As you can see, the mean is pretty much zero. And also the fluctuations are pretty consistent level. They're not increasing or decreasing through time, which is the main thing. So we've got stable variance. Now we go into the modeling part. So remember I said we can use the ACF and PACF to deduce the orders of our autoregressive components and our moving average components. So the way we plot it is neatly done for us in Python is that we can call these two plot PACF and plot ACF functions uh, from stats models. And we simply just call it on our um, different data set. And all we're gonna show is basically some components. So this autocorrelation value, as you can see here, we have a peak at 12, which makes sense, right? Because this shows us that the lag at 12 is very highly correlated with the lag at one. This makes sense because our data is clearly has some yearly seasonality. So the lag at July will correlate very well with the lag of July in the previous year. Um, and so this is what's, the, what's, what's noticing here. This blue region signifies whether the lags are statistically significant. So basically whether the correlation is um, quite probable or not. Uh, so in this case, we'll probably accept everything, you know, until 12, but we'll probably pick 12 other seasonal components. So, you know, in this case, a fair one will probably be like 10 lags or so. Again, it's up to your discretion, really. Normally what I do is I'll just try all of these lags out and see which model gives us the best solution given some testing set. But if you're going to do it by hand like this, then it's really kind of subjective to which lags you include in your model. Like I said, to me, we know the seasonal component would be 12 or because we have, um, we well, can see there's a big peak here and number of seasonal values will add, I don't know, maybe just one, as you can see here, the lags aren't very significant there and our regular AR components will probably be around 10 or so, or eight, you know, again, it's up to our discretion, but that's something I'll go for. The partial autocorrelation, um, does something similar. So this will show us whether what um, lags will also include for the autoregressive components. So we'll, this is sorry, this was for moving average um, and partial autocorrelation is for autoregression. We have CSE on a pattern though, to be honest. So as again, a big peak at 12, um, lag 12, clearly because of yearly seasonality. And then what we can do is that we can measure, you know, um, the rest, as you can see, kind of tails off after the 10th flag or so. So again, 10 moving average, also 10 autoregression components and one for the um, seasonal components with a seasonal length of 12. So like I have written here, we, have really, we observe our series as a yearly seasonality, which is pretty obvious. Um, and we, and, but then our plot confirm this as we can see a spikes under 12 lags. Again, what I've discussed. The lags are also significant to around 10th, you know, kind of 10th, maybe a bit more, but you know, around that value. Um, and so we, what we indicates to us is that we're gonna have, you know, a autoregressive component of 10, and then maybe an average of 10. And we're also going to have a one for the seasonal autoregressive component and a one for the seasonal moving average component. Again, this is all kind of arbitrary. It's up to the forecast's discretion. These values may change. Like you, ideally, what you want to do, you want to try on multiple like of these orders and see which one gives you the best results. Uh, but this is just showing you how you do it for first principles. Now we've got our order. We can now fit the model. So what we're going to do is that we're going to spin test and train. Train set is the first eighty percent. Test set is the remaining. 20% and then we're going to build a model, a Rima, and we're going to specify here the order. So this is the 10, 1, 10, we declared above, and the seasonal values are 1, 1, 1, 12. Again, the 12 is kind of written inside the tuple um, because of notation and Python and specific uh, structures, but the 12 here indicates a season. And we're going to fit it, and then we're going to forecast it, and then we're going to do the inverse box Cox transform so that we can, um, you know, the box Cox transform, what it does, it kind of is on the units of the original forecast. So we need to do the inverse of it when we're actually forecasting. Here, I have another difference thing in, in the, like I'm not passing a difference thing data set. I'm, the difference is gonna be done for us as I specified here with the one. So we're gonna do one difference thing here and one signal difference thing as well. So it's gonna do for us. Um, and then it's also gonna do the undifferencing for us as well in the, in the, in the model the forecast, but we've got to apply our own um, inverse box cocks. Hope that makes sense. Again, notebook and the blog is attached in the description, so you can go over it in your own time. Don't worry about all this. It's just, you know, sometimes it doesn't, it, their likelihood may not like it, but it, it doesn't make a difference. Right, cool. So now what we're gonna do is simply plot the forecast. 
and voila as you can see it's done pretty well right I mean we've got the seasonal components pretty good um, and it matches the test test the test set quite good and um, yeah, overall, pretty happy with this results. Again, Serima, it's got seasonal components and also the regular Arima model. So it's really kind of capturing everything you probably need. The only downside of Serima is that it hasn't, it can't model multiple seasonalities. It can only model one seasonality component at the same time. So say you have daily data, um, which has a weekly, uh, weekly and yearly seasonality, then you can't capture that. And that's when we use something called harmonic regression, which is something I'll link in the description below if you're interested in that. But that's to do a four-year series. Uh, but like I said, done pretty well here, so I'm pretty happy with this result. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about time series and forecasting, then make sure you check out the other videos in this playlist. Also to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.